friendly neighborhood nerds, we have returning guest star creator and author of Philadelphia, Rodney Barnes, here with us today. Thanks for joining us again, Rodney. How Thank have you, you been? How's life? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Doing well. <laughs> yeah. What's uh What's happened since the last time we spoke? You've been oh busy at work, I see. Yeah, I'm just writing a bunch of books, um, writing television, writing film, just staying busy writing. Love it. I love that about you. Um, speaking of, you've just released issue 20 of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. which is a big deal in today's climate, right? Like that's a long running creator owned title. Um, yeah. I'm curious, like, has it evolved in ways that you didn't expect? Is there an end in sight? Um, uh, how has it evolved? I mean, I think you know, it started off, it's funny because when people comment or write things to me about the book, you know, they always, they thought it was going to be like a procedural noir kind of um, detective story with vampires. And it sort of evolved into like this dark fantasy that has horror elements as well, because you have your classic vampires, werewolves, that type of thing. But then there's this other component to it that sort of connects to um, spirituality and a bunch of other things. So yeah. it's tough to describe, but it has certainly evolved from what it originally was in that first issue. See, that's a question I had for you too. That's a good segue because I am an Australian woman. I know very little about, well, before I started reading this, I knew a lot less about uh, American history, the founding mm -hmm. fathers, all that fun stuff. Obviously mm -hmm. a lot of readers of this title are going to be going down research rabbit holes. What, are you wanting them specifically to learn um, if you could like guide, I guess, well, enjoyers well, of your content? Well, what I do is I sort of take, I start at a place of truth and then I try to create a bridge to fantasy. Um, but even within that fantasy, I still try to sort of adhere to certain principles. Um, when I was growing up and I would take history classes, um, I always felt like it was sort of, um, stale you know there, there was this there was this quality to it to where you're talking about people who no longer exist and you're talking about war in an abstract sort of factual way but when you think about war certainly in what's going on right now with the ukraine and different parts of the world you realize that war is this huge thing that has this human emotional uh, toll that it takes on folks and i wanted to add that emotional component to history i wanted to figure out a way to create a, um, a sense of, uh, you know, there's this thing called generational trauma where folks who have gone through, you know, I'm sure any group that has been put upon by another group has sort of felt this thing. And I wanted to speak to like with women patriarchy, that's sort of what Abigail Adams speaks to um, with the African-American characters. They speak to slavery and the civil war and other issues. Um, so there's something that's sort of there that I try to, to speak to certain topics, but not just in a way that feels like, oh, this week we're going to talk about this. You know, I mm -hmm. try to put it in a character's feelings, whether that's anger, whether there's regret or grief or guilt or whatever it is, whatever part that they played in that um, historical context. I wanted them to be able to interpret the emotional component, not just the factual component. So you'll find some things that are true, and then you'll find other things that I've sort of recreated in order or created in order to make it connect emotionally. Amazing. Um, like a good writer does, I guess, right? Uh, speaking of emotional connections to uh, women that suffer at the hands of the patriarchy, Abigail mm -hmm. um, is such an amazing villain. Like, I need to know more about how you think about her and how you... Uh, shaped her in your mind because she is so evil <laughs> I, I you know it's funny i don't see her necessarily as evil i see her as someone who has emotionally been the the stuff that the nurturing aspect that is stereotypically applied to women mm -hmm. um certainly women of a certain period of time in history um all that's gone it's sort of been beaten out from living under a patriarchal dynamic um, and everything that comes with that, the limiting, you know, she had dreams, she had talents, she had things that, you know, she could have actualized in life, but because of the way the world worked, she wasn't able to sort of do that and be that. 
And so even if she may have forgotten about the particular things that those things may have been, she still remembers the feeling and the echo of the feeling. And now she's got power and she's got perspective and she has immortality. So anything she's doing now that connects to that period of time is sort of um, habitual. It's a choice. You know, she's choosing to, to hold on to those things. And I think desperately she wants to break away from them. So part of destroying humanity is destroying the construct that she had to live under that was tyrannical, you know, to her. So, you know, I don't think she looks at herself as evil. I think she looks at herself as not wanting to be part of a world that operated like the world she came from operates. Uh, we see that in a lot of characters through the series, right? Um mm -hmm. Seesaw is another one that comes mm -hmm. to mind. Um, so we're kind of getting a little bit of, I'm going to just jump straight into spoilers, actually. Yeah, uh, go for it. 19, we saw Seesaw kind of disappear and we were wondering where he's gone. And then um, I guess, spoiler alert, George Washington is in the mix now. Uh, so I guess my question is like, how many other founding fathers can we expect to be caught up in this nightmare? Well, and one of the things I never wanted the book to become was the book of dead presidents. Where it was just about, okay, next week when I run out of ideas, I'm going to bring another president. Um, I didn't want that to be the case. Um, I think if you look at the, the sequential nature of how these presidents appeared, we started with John Adams. Then we had Thomas Jefferson. And John Adams was the second president, Thomas Jefferson being the third. Then we went back to the first. And the reason that it was in that order was because it was always Washington was first because he was the first. Mm -hmm. And um, you sort of needed Adams. Adams had a lesser degree of skill set by what historians say if, by comparison to Washington and Jefferson. So if Washington was able to prey upon Adams's shortcomings in order to get his grand scheme across, which is what the book is about, um, to a degree, the political part of the book is about. And Jefferson sort of had a certain degree of charisma, and he had some skills that maybe Adams didn't have, but Adams had some things he didn't have. The two of them worked in tandem to be able to um, sort of act as uh, unbeknownst to them, like Abbott and Costello, I guess, of the political world. And their leader was really just hiding in the shadows, waiting for the right time to be able to come out and you know, exact his plan, but he needed chaos to reign in order for that to happen. And due to Adams and due to Jefferson, we sort of have chaos in the streets of Philadelphia. So now Washington reappears. How do you personally, and uh, feel free to say this question is too hard, but uh, how do you personally view the founding fathers? Like, what do you think their mistakes were? Um, I, I don't think, you know, the word mistake I wouldn't use the word mistake. I would say that the, the critique that I would give the founding fathers is a critique that there's nothing that they could actually do about it. It's that they did what they did for the time that they did it. You know, it's sort of like religion in a way that if you take first century wisdom and you try to apply it to 21st century thinking, there are a lot of things that could be misinterpreted due to, um, you know, just the differences in the way that people walk, talk, technology, a lot of different things. I think when you look at the founding fathers and what they were thinking, they were thinking about their time. And there are some things in there to where they did consider a changing world, but they never could have probably imagined a world where people would be going to space, um, <laughs> where you would have guns that could fire a hundred rounds in a second. Um, you know, there's just technology alone has changed the way that the world operates, not just the nation. Um, you know, they had to take ships to get from A to B. We can take a plane and get to another, another continent in a matter of hours. So, you know, when you talk about making rules and, and legislation for sensibilities that operate in that type of way, I think it's difficult to amend those things. You know, there's going to be resistance to say, no, it should be the way it's always been. Well, you know, there was slavery during that period of time. There were a lot of different things that, you know, the world has changed. So mm -hmm. those changes, I think, play into um, 
the need to continuously make amendments and build upon the stuff that's good. You know, I think there's a framework and that framework is attached to a lot of other ideologies and political philosophies from other societies. Um, but I think it's always a thing about evolving. And unfortunately, it seems like you have, when things are so polarized, change becomes a polarizing idea. Um, whoever's trying to create change is seen as the enemy. And mm -hmm. the status quo becomes the thing that I think is difficult to um, to maintain in a changing society. So there you go. Nice. That was a amazing. <laughs> so I try. I'm gonna have I try. To, I'm gonna have to digest it. Um, I have uh, a couple more questions for yeah. you. One is, um, how do you think vampires would be received truly in like today's day and age, modern social well, media, all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, uh, vampires as the real thing, if they actually existed, or the story of vampires? Uh, vampires is the real thing. Like, let's say we get, like, an announcement that it turns out Biden actually did die eight years yeah. ago. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully he'd look a little younger. If, uh, That's that right. Case, but uh, <laughs> nothing against our president. But just saying, sometimes they don't, they, they could do a little more with the makeup and stuff. Right. Um, I think... You know, the thing about vampires, certainly because of time and age, and one of the reasons I chose to write a book about them, is that you would hope that during um, their evolution, because they've seen, like, think the founding fathers, if the founding fathers were to continue to exist and evolve and live, they would see the changes that are taking place in the world. So they are armed with perspective. And as long as they don't weaponize that perspective, um, I think that if you, they were to be introduced into the world, they would be just another thing. And hopefully if they were civilized in the way that I try to, at least some of them, um, tell those stories that they would be able to integrate within a civilized society. Um, the problem is, I don't know if, you know, there's a thing that happens with ego. And a, a lot of times, a lot of characters in the book suffer from that, um, how they see themselves and how they think they figure into the world. When you say a founding father, a father is a very, is a parental designation, that leader like king. And it's hard, I think, to connect to the average person. When you stand above them, you know, um, it's difficult. And I think in today's world, that's part of the, the problematic nature of leadership. And I think the systems, when you look at things like with COVID, when COVID hit, it was so difficult to get everybody on the same page. And, you know, we can, you and I can have this conversation miles apart via a computer and technology. But yet when it came to everybody working, you know, on one page to try to solve a thing, it becomes politicized and the systems divisive. don't work and divisive yeah. and all of these different things. And I'm not taking a side. I'm just saying the nature of being able to roll out a campaign for the greater good of this society that is supposed to be united. It's in the name, you know, United <laughs> States. So, and the fact that it isn't, I think, um, or it's so difficult, um, speaks to a lot of the divisiveness that happens in society. And I think, so you add in something like vampires, and I think you would have a group that would say, okay, what are they all about? And listen to what they had to say if they were coming that way. And they weren't coming like predators. And we'll figure yeah. out a way like I do. Of You can go to the morgue and we'll take the dead blood and you can drink that <laughs> so you don't have to eat people. And we'll figure out systems and ways. And maybe they can be uh, carnivorous. They can eat rodents or whatever it is, wherever they get their blood source, as long as it's not from people and we can make an <laughs> But then there would be another group that would probably say, how can we trust them? You know, yes. how, what, what do they stand for? Where did they come from? How do you know that they're not a virus like this, blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, we're on Capitol Hill, you know, with some type of population um, <laughs> saying we have to kill all the virus <laughs> or lock them up. But uh, something, they're in Guantanamo Bay now, all the vampires yeah. or something. That would be so fascinating. I do wonder, I know True Blood kind of touched on this a bit as well with like whether the introduction of vampires into modern society would lessen uh, like the systemic racism that we see on a daily basis now because it would be redirected towards this other type of being. Essentially, it would be like a new form of racism would be to like hate vampires. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. 
<laughs> I think that the stuff that is hardwired is hardwired. Yeah, you it's too foundational, it in, right? Yeah, it's foundational both in um, the idea of what the society is. And, you know, we are taught, if you go to school in America, you're basically taught that one group is responsible for anything of note. And if you're a child learning this, then, you know, you sort of walk in a place of if you're not of that group, um, you probably are second class or, mm -hmm. you know, you fall into a category. It doesn't have to be stated that way, but just emotionally, you receive the information in that way of just thinking, well, you know, what did my group do? Absolutely. And it separates immediately. So unless you have that type of history with vampires, you know, if vampires were in that place or if they suffered some of the ills that women have or that, you know, uh, sexual orientation or whatever it is, things that go against religion, certain religions like Christianity has certain things mm -hmm. um, or has been used to, to say that certain groups of certain behavior is sinful or blah, 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 blah. Any of the separating things, doctrines or, or all of that stuff, I think vampires would have to be integrated into all of that in order to be to hit the type of devices divisiveness that you see in society today so i don't know so you know that, i don't know no that's a really i mean it's a lot to think about that's part of why Philadelphia is so great right is like thematically it touches on a lot you you touch on like the separation um that people of color feel when it comes to like housing projects and mm -hmm. um the the drug epidemic and uh, obviously there's a lot of like father son thematically throughout the series in different ways um, arguably even mother daughter at times um, and I'm wondering are there any like other titles or one shots or spin-offs that you think are going to spawn out of this series like will we see well yeah Nita Hall's nightmare blog is a spin-off um, nice well and this is issue Number six that just uh, Jason Shaw and Alexander cover. Um, Amazing. And, you know, I, I also have four more, three more spinoffs on my Substack page of um, Incredible. 20 Degrees. I'm looking through my board. Uh, 20 Degrees <laughs> Past Rigor. That is a zombie series that I'm uh, set in the polluted waters of Flint. Um, Johnny Gatlin, which is a uh, gunfighter in hell. Um, but it is loosely connected to Philadelphia as well. Um, Elysium Gardens with the werewolves. They, um, their ongoing story is on my um, Substack page, but their current story is in Philadelphia right now. Amazing. Um, so yeah, um, there will always be as long as there are ideas and you know quality folks to want to join on, join in, and you know make stuff with me. Um, I'll keep going. Absolutely. Uh, I I hope. Um, to see it as a reader and a fan you know like this is something that it feels uh you know how you consume a piece of content and you'll you wonder why it hasn't been done before or why it hasn't been done this good that's how it feels reading Philadelphia. it feels okay. important um it feels entertaining uh it's also like devastating emotionally devastating at times which is something I personally enjoy as a masochist reader yep <laughs> I got, um, we're, we're, we're of the same kind. We, we yeah. enjoy the same stuff. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me that likes to hurt when I read. Um, Rodney, uh, is there anything you'd like to, apart from like, obviously the series you just let us know about, is there anything in the works that you want us to promote? Anything that you'd like people to buy, check out? Um, you know, there are much of the things that are coming, you know, there's a ways off. I think the only thing that's closest is uh, I'm doing a Mandalorian series for um, Marvel Lucasfilm uh, that drops June the 22nd, I believe. Wow. That's the closest thing. Um, Philadelphia 2021 or 22, I lose track of it, should be here in two weeks. <laughs> yes. You know, Nightmare Blog will be here next Wednesday. Um, uh, so yeah, it seems like I do a lot of books. So there's a lot of <laughs> stuff. You know, I know there's an Army of Darkness trade coming soon and a James Bond trade coming soon and um, a lot of different things. So just stay tuned. Great. Amazing. Rodney, thank you. Mr. Barnes, thank no, you for Rodney, your time. Rodney, Rodney, <laughs> come on. Rodney. I don't even know uh, who Mr. Barnes is. 
thank you for your time, your creations, um, your efforts. It's much appreciated by us, the comics community and fans. Um, and everyone else that's watching, if you haven't read Philadelphia, again, I put this on Twitter. I don't know what the fuck you're doing with your life. Get your shit together. <laughs> read it. Uh, and wash your what hands, wear said. a mask. Yeah, what exactly. What she said. I didn't say. It was her. I have, I have yeah. All right. Peace. If you want to hear interviews from industry pros, get first looks, and have access to endless comic content, wake up. Please wake up. You're in a coma. Your mother misses you.